Hello brothers and sisters in Christ. Go ahead and turn to 1 Timothy 4. We're going to be reading 1 through 6. Okay. I wish Brother Brian's uh, little study on um, 1 Timothy 4, 1 through 5. And I started doing my own expository study. And there's a lot more to it. And there's some things that uh, I realize I have wrong and I, I believe he has wrong. But um, I just wanted to do an expository study. So I started going through it saying, you know what? This would be a great study, and it's very, very important for today. So it's going to be a long study. It's probably going to be a multi-part. So we're just going to be breezing through it. I'm only have the Bible open to 1 Timothy 4, verses 1 through 6, and we'll be talking about other scriptures. Remember, you can always pause and turn and unpause. That's what I do when I watch the other brethren's studies. I always pause because I'm slow at turning, and then uh, unpause the video. So we're going to read through the whole thing once, and then we're going to go through it and talk about some things. Okay. Now, the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron, forbidding to marry, and commanding to abstain from meats, which God hath created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. I have that highlighted in red, them which believe and know the truth. Okay, there's a lot of people that have head knowledge, but they don't have, it's not down here, it's up here. Okay, believe is down here, know is up here. That's why it says believe and know the truth. Verse 4, for every creature of God is good and nothing to be refused if it be received with thanksgiving, for it is sanctified by the word of God and prayer. Now 6 is so important because it ties the first 5 together. How so? Let's read it. If thou put the brethren in remembrance of these things, that's what Paul's doing with Timothy. Okay? If thou put the brethren in remembrance of these things, thou shalt be a good minister of Jesus Christ. Paul put Timothy in remembrance of these things. Timothy put it in who he was preaching to, and now I'm going to be preaching to you, brother and sister Christ, to help put it in remembrance of you. Okay? Because I want to be a good minister for Jesus Christ, of Jesus Christ. Nourished up in the words of faith. This is the words of faith today. King James Bible, which we'll be talking about that. And of good doctrine, whereunto thou hast attained. Now two things as we're going to go through here, I want to point out just at the very beginning. This is Paul writing to Timothy, a young man in ministry. For instruction in righteousness, we're going to learn a lot of stuff for all brothers and sisters in Christ. But one thing you got to understand is, is men in ministry were being called to do what Paul's doing here. Okay? If thou put the brethren in remembrance of these things, just like Paul's putting Timothy in the remembrance of these things, thou shalt be a good minister of Jesus Christ. That's my heart, is to show you guys what's going on here and to put you in remembrance of these things. We're going to talk about a lot of different doctrines. Just briefly going over them to show the doctrine that's found here and how the world is perverting them, turning them into doctrines of devils. Okay? That's one thing. Who's it written to? A young man in ministry. And that young man's being told, this is what's going to happen, and you need to keep people in remembrance so they're not part, basically part of the falling away. Okay? And how you can tell false converts from real ones. So, we're going to slowly start going through it again. But I just wanted to read it all, and I wanted to put 6 in there because it's so important. 1 through 5 is pointless without 6. Why? Because 6, it says, if thou put the brethren in remembrance of these things. That's what Paul's doing. That's the whole point. If Paul wasn't putting Timothy in remembrance of these things, we wouldn't have this to read to be put in remembrance. Now, I understand God's words. He'll get it out there regardless. But you hopefully you understand what I'm saying. That's the whole point, to put you in remembrance. Now, I'm going to put you in remembrance of these things. Okay? So let's go back to the beginning. Verse 1. Now, the Spirit speaketh expressly. Now, Brother Brian did a study on this recently, on another meaning for this whole passage, but I'm just doing an expository study because I really wanted to get through this. But the one thing that really pointed me to wanting to do this is the word expressly. Brother Brian said that it meant it was very important. Okay? Very important. And I'm like, no, no, that's not what it means. What it means is, is 
uh, especially, I was, I was trading the word out for especially when it's expressly, but I kept saying, thinking in my head, especially, what it means is, is what's going on then, it's going to get worse and worse, and it's especially going to be happening in the latter days. I mean, that's what the word is, is especially. And when I read it again, I'm like, no, it's not especially, that's, I had it wrong. It's expressly. So what does expressly mean? Remember, part of this ministry for you, brothers and sisters of Christ, to help motivate you that God chose certain words for a reason. Okay? Words have meaning. So, I looked in the Bible, and you know that the word expressly is used three times in the King James Bible. Only three times. Okay? So what does it mean? First, I looked at the Webster's 1828 Dictionary. Now, I always warn you, brothers and sisters in Christ, I don't always go off the Webster's 1828 Dictionary. Okay, because it's not always right. But it's usually, it's a good thing to look off of first or second, or whatever. It's a good tool, don't get me wrong. Because for this instance, it happens to be right on. But expressly does not mean very important. What does expressly mean? It means in direct terms, plainly. I'm speaking directly, plainly. There's no room for error. There's no room for confusion. I'm not speaking in riddles. I'm not speaking in parables. I'm not trying to deceive. I'm not trying to beat around the bush. I'm speaking directly and plainly. That's what expressly means. Uh, turn to 1 Samuel 20, 21. Let's look at the three times that it's mentioned. We already saw one, so we have to look at the other two times that it's mentioned. 1 Samuel 20, 21 says, And behold, I will send a lad saying, Go, find out the arrows. I'll stop there for a second. This is King David, and my brain freezes sometimes, but it's Sa Solomon, it's King Saul, his son, Jonathan. Okay? Yeah, thank you, Lord. Um, the whole thing is, is King David's telling Jonathan that, hey, I'm your father's out to kill me, he's against me, and Jonathan's, no, he's not, no, he's not. So they do this big test where Jonathan's going to go talk to S Saul and say he let David go uh, give... Um, sacrifice with his family. That's why he's not there at the table, the king's table. And he says when he comes back, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to shoot an arrow, and that's where we're at, where he's saying, I'll do this. And this will let you know if the king really wants your life, or if you're just seeing things, basically. So let's start all over real quick. And behold, I will send a lad saying, go find out the arrows. If I expressly say unto the lad, behold, the arrows are on this side of thee, take them, then come thou, for there is peace to thee, and no hurt as the Lord liveth. And then he goes on to say, but if I say it's further, you know, then he does have you hurt, and you need to flee for your life. But notice it says expressly there. He's saying, I'm speaking plainly and direct. There's no room for error here. There's none. Because this has to do with his life. This has to do with someone's life. David's life. Okay? So when I read that, I was like, yeah, the Webster's 18 actually seems to be right on with that. Direct and plainly is what that means. Second time it's mentioned is in Ezekiel chapter 1, verse 3. The word of the Lord came expressly unto Ezekiel the priest. Direct and plainly it came to Ezekiel. Okay, the son of Buzai in the land of the Chaldeans by the river of Chebar. And the hand of the Lord was there upon him. The definition's right on. It's saying it plainly and directly came to Ezekiel. So expressly does not mean very important. It means direct and plain. There's no time. I mean, it's important. All of God's word is important. So it's it, not saying that it's not. I'm not saying it's not important. But words have meaning. It's so important in the fact that expressly means. He's being direct. He's being plain. That's how important this is that Paul's writing to Timothy. It's so important. I'm not beating around the bush. I'm not going to try to, you know, over, you know, how you hear someone say over, oversimplify something. Something so simple, but they overdo it and make it where it becomes complicated when it's so simple. It's just straight to the point. Okay. And then the third time it's mentioned is 1 Timothy 4, 1, which we're reading right now. So, now the Spirit speaketh expressly. It means directly, plainly. Okay? That in the latter times, we're going to stop there. 
Okay, latter times says some shall depart from the faith. But in latter times, sometimes we slip up and we say, well, it's talking about the last days. Well, I want to make a very good point, brothers and sisters in Christ. To them, they were in the last days. Let's read some stuff, okay? We're supposed to live every generation when we pass on the younger generation, like you have Paul, the older generation, passing on to Timothy, the younger generation of saved brothers and sisters in Christ. Every generation is supposed to live like Jesus could come back in their lifetime. Jesus can come back any day now. That's how they're living, okay? So when it says latter times, let's read something real quick. Why didn't Paul say last days? People say, well, it means the same thing. Turn to 2 Timothy 3.1. This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. Remember, we talked about this if you've been following this ministry. There's people that love God, but they love pleasures more. They're still lost. They have a, th they have a little desire for love for God, but their love for pleasures and sin outweighs their love for God, and that's what prevents them from getting saved. Okay, They won't come to God broken and throw that iniquity at the foot of the cross. I didn't say clean up their lives, I said throw their iniquity. They're not holding in their heart that desire there for pleasure. The love of pleasures gets thrown at the foot of the cross, so their love for God can abound. Okay. Having a form of godliness, remember that, form of godliness, but denying the power thereof, from such turn away. Why did Paul use last days in 2 Timothy 3.1, but over here in 1 uh, Timothy 4.1, he says in the latter days. We're going to keep going here because there's a lot here I want to read. Um, but I believe it's because you're supposed to be looking for Jesus to come back any day now. Okay? I'm going to hold my finger there. I've been saved for five years. And in five years, the latter days, you know, it's like I got saved. And I've seen so many people fall away. Though I've seen the world get worse and worse and worse. And the latter days, in other words, as days go by, Timothy, you're going to see these things. And it's going to get worse and worse and worse. I've seen it in the five years that I've been saved. If you hit somebody up that's been saved for 50 years, Bible-believing, God-fearing, God has changed their life. And you ask them from day one to day 50, have you seen a lot of people fall away? I bet you they'd be saying, just tears. Paul talks about this. We'll get to us. Tears. So many people falling away. So many false converts out there. The world is just getting worse and worse and worse. Listen to all this stuff that we're reading. This stuff, I believe, was happening in Paul's time and Timothy's time. But in the last days, it's going to, perilous times shall come. It's going to get worse and worse and worse as we get closer and closer to the catching up of the body of Christ. We don't know when that's going to happen. We're to live every day like it's going to happen today. It could happen today. It could happen right now as I'm doing this video. Okay, verse 6. From such, turn away. We're going to see that a lot. If they're not following the proper doctrines, turn away. You know, if they're causing division because they're going against the doctrines, they're trying to sow seeds of destruction, good words and fair speeches, from such withdraw thyself, you know, stuff like that. We're going to read a lot of that stuff. From such turn away. Verse 6. For of this sort are they which creep into houses. That's why you turn away. I'm sorry. Why you turn away. You say, well, what's the big deal? Why is it so important that we have to kick them out and not fellowship with them and allow them into our fellowship? Verse 6, For of this sort are they which creep into houses and lead captive silly women laden with sins, led away with diverse lusts. Remember what we read in chapter 4, it says, Some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. There's going to be seducing spirits. Diverse lusts. There's people that have lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. But they're going to come in and they're going to cause destruction. 
They're going to cause division. They're going to cause people to fall away from the faith. That's why you don't give them a, a subjection, not, not for an hour. I forgot that verse. You give them a subjection, no, not for an hour. You give them nothing. You have nothing to do with them, and you don't allow them into your fellowship, because they're going to destroy people. It's people who are saved, they're going to destroy. Verse 7, Ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Now as James and Jambri withstood Moses, so do these also resist the truth. You have those people that they ask questions because they want answers, and you have people ask questions just to ask questions. Okay? They're resisting the truth. Men of corrupt minds reprobate concerning the faith. They're false. They're fake concerning the faith. They're not one of us. They like to pretend they are, but they're not one of us. But they shall proceed no further, for their folly shall be manifest unto all men as theirs also was. Are we seeing that today? A lot of more people falling away, falling away. We're finding that uh, there's a lot more false converts. We're seeing them. They're, they're sticking out like a sore thumb in these last days. There's so much wickedness and so much corruption around that they like to be a part of, and they're starting to stick out. They start changing. Well, I was a part of this faith, but now I'm a part of this over here. They change the doctrines so they can continue in that wickedness and the sinfulness of the world. Okay. They're, they're, they're being made manifest more and more as day goes by. Like I said, five years I've seen so many people fall away. So many false converts more than anything, big time. But I've seen brethren fall away that I believe are saved. And they get messed up. Right? Verse 10, But thou hast fully known my doctrine. There we see the word doctrine. Thou hast fully known my doctrine. Manner of life. See, people say it's just a profession of faith. You just say it, I'm a Christian, and I, that means you're a Christian. Paul says, no, you know my doctrine, what I preach, basically, my manner of life, how I live, that I have a purpose. God's called me, called him into ministry. His faith, he's faithful, long-suffering, charity, patient, persecutions, afflictions, which came unto me at Antioch, at Iconium, at Lystra, what persecutions I endured, but out of all, let's say, but out of them all the Lord delivered me. It's not just in word, it's in deed. I can't remember if we'll get to that verse. It's one of my uh, verses I think you should have memorized, but whatever you do in word or in deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's word and deed. It's not just words. Okay. Paul didn't say, just take my word for it. He says, hey, persecutions. Look, it's not just my doctrines. It's not just what I preach. My manner of life, how I live a life of Christ. I'm in Christ Jesus. I'm after Christ. We'll see verses that talk about in Christ, after Christ. I, we won't get into those verses that talk about how Jesus is your foundation. He's also the head of the corner. He's the beginning. He's the last. Everything starts with Jesus when you get saved, and everything ends with Jesus. He's everything. Okay. To help you out with doctrine, the best way to help you out, brother and sister, with doctrine, a doctrine will point you to Jesus Christ, so you're going after Jesus Christ, the real Jesus Christ of Scripture. That's what the doctrine is. And when you get doctrines of devils, you're not going after Jesus Christ, you're going after Satan. You're going after the world. It's very important. That's why Paul says this is very important. If thou be put in verse 6 in uh, 1 Timothy 4, if thou put the brethren in remembrance of these things, thou shalt be a good minister. It's important to keep the brethren in remembrance of these things. Okay? It does, this passage doesn't have 50 million different meanings. Okay, All scripture is given by inspiration of God is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. You look for those four things, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Change life. But you look at those four things when you look through here, of course. But for instruction righteousness, this doesn't have a million meanings. Like one, the first verse doesn't have a million meanings. He's saying, I'm speaking expressly, plainly, specifically. There's no room for, it could mean this, or it could mean that, or it could mean... It means one thing and one thing only. Specifically. But mainly those four things. But I'm saying, for instruction in righteousness, it means one thing. For doctrine, it means one thing. For reproof, it means one thing. For correction, it means one thing. Plainly. Specifically. 
Okay, directly, I'm sorry, the word directly and plainly. Okay. But remember, it's the last days. He's saying all this stuff's going to happen in the last days. He's talking through his lifetime in the last days. It's, it could happen in my lifetime. It might be out there a little ways. But I'm supposed to act like it's going to happen in my time, and I'm warning Timothy. Okay. Turn to Philippians 3.20. He says, latter days. I believe what he's talking about is as the days go by and we get later and later, all things are going to deteriorate with time. That's, what is it, the law of thermodynamics? I think brother said it before. I think it was brother Brian who taught me that. The laws of thermodynamics, everything gets worse and worse with time. And Paul's saying as he sees his ministering, people are coming in and destroying everything that he's He's set up. He's preached the plan of salvation. He's led these people to Christ. He's told these people how to live a life of Christ. Other people are coming in. They're messing up the gospel. They're messing up doctrine. They're messing everything up, even in his lifetime. And he's saying in the latter days, as the days go by, time, every, as the days go by, things are going to keep getting worse and worse and worse until Jesus Christ comes back and sets things right. Okay. Philippians 3.20 for our conversation is in heaven, from whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change our vile bodies, that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body, according to the working whereby we, he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. The key there for this study is, is whence also we look for the Savior. Who's the we? Will you say it's saved sinners? Yes. But specifically for the subject, a subject, he's talking about anybody at the time that was reading this. We look for Jesus Christ to come back any day. This, he didn't use the words last days, though. He used the words latter times. Latter times. Timothy, as you see time go on, go by, time goes by, time goes by, the longer you're in ministry, the longer you live a life of Christ, you grow old, you're going to see these things. Okay? Things are going to get worse. And what he's talking about is the doctrines of devils. All the doctrines that Paul preached, he's saying you're going to see them get perverted, and it's going to get worse and worse and worse over time. Okay? Turn to Titus 2.11. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. All men. Anybody can get saved today. Okay? Please, 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 there's always, when we read up here, verse 2, of 1 Timothy 4, verse 2, speaking lies and hypocrisy, there's always people going to lie about me and Bible-believing, God-fearing ministries. Not just mine, but other brethren out there too. Okay? Anybody can get saved. I don't decide who gets saved. Um, anybody can get saved. It says it right there. Salvation hath appeared to all men. Appeared. Didn't, not all men have it. It appeared to all men. Anybody can get saved today, but so many people are rejecting Jesus Christ. So many people are rejecting the real Jesus Christ for a counterfeit. Doctrines of God that point you after Jesus Christ, the real Jesus Christ, for doctrines of devils that point you after Satan and the world. Okay. Verse 12, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, no, oh, that's works-based salvation, right? No, I'm being sarcastic. We should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. Change life. Okay. 13. Also, the sober part, what we're talking about here, when we get to the doctrines and how people are perverting, we're supposed to be sober. We're supposed to be vigilant. That's why we as Bible-believing, God-fearing men in ministry, we point these things out to you. These people are preaching false. Stay away from them. They have doctrines of devils. They have false doctrines. Okay. Verse 13. Looking for that blessed hope. See, even back then, they're looking for Jesus Christ to come back. We're supposed to look for Jesus Christ to come back. And the point I always keep making is, is before 13, it talks about the changed life. Living the life of Christ. Teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. The changed life. Then it says, well, why are you working so hard? I mean, I'm saying this. Why are you working so hard for the changed life? Read verse 13. Looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. 
Jesus Christ isn't just our Savior, He is our great, capital G, God, singular. God the Father. That's a whole other thing. But the whole thing I've always pointed at, brothers and sisters in Christ, when I say you're supposed to be looking for Jesus Christ to come back any day now, it's not just sitting here looking up in the clouds. Every day just sitting here looking up in the clouds. I do that sometimes when I'm resting, sitting on the deck, I talk with the Lord, I look at the clouds, I watch the sun go down every evening, praise the Lord when He lets me. And, but that's not what it means. Looking for Jesus Christ is a physical action on how you live your life. Are you living a life of Christ? Are you letting, sanctifying your life? Are you letting God clean up your life? Get bad things out of your life? Are you doing the things you're supposed to be doing? That's you looking for Jesus Christ to come back any day. Verse 14, Who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people zealous of good works. These things speak and exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no man despise thee. Okay? We're supposed to speak this to you. As a brother in Christ, we're supposed to hold each other accountable to the Word of God. Are you living a life of Christ? Hey, brother, I've seen you fall back into that sin. I fell into uh, one of my addictions um, recently, and I fell flat on my face, and God chastised me. Okay? Uh, brother in Christ points it out. Hey, what you're doing isn't right. I'm not supposed to despise him. And we see that so much, Brother Jesus Christ, when we step on people's toes and we call them out on their sins and saying, Hey, um, you're not denying ungodliness there. You're falling into worldly lusts. Uh, you're not being sober. You're not living righteously. Uh, you're not living godly. Okay? And we point these things out, people start to despise you. As a brother and sister in Christ, we're not to despise you. Let no man despise thee. We do it with love. But we do it earnestly, but we do it with love and with grace, with brothers and sisters in Christ. But I've seen this happen so much that when I get called out on sin, I say, thank you, Lord. I thank the brother. Repent, forsake, get back to my walk with the Lord. Was it deny yourself, pick up your cross daily, and follow me, is what Jesus said. You get back to your walk with the Lord and doing the work of the Lord. All right? I don't despise people that call me out on my sin or my errors. All right? We're supposed to do that. We're supposed to speak, exhort, and rebuke. Exhort those. We're supposed to say, "Are you? do you still read your Bible every morning and every night? Start your day with the Word of God and end it with the day? And you have a brother or sister in Christ, so, oh yes, I still do that. Praise the Lord. You exhort them. That's great. I'm glad you do that. I do that, and it's, we all need to do that. Praise the Lord that you're doing that. It's exhortation. Then those that you find someone that isn't, you rebuke them. Hey, you need to be starting your day with the Word of God, and you need to be ending, ending your day with the Word of God. Do whatever you can, even if it's just flicks. There's times where I wake up late and I got stuff I have to do, like time related. I'll flip through here because I've highlighted, which is why I love highlighting. I'll flip through pages and stop in a page and read some of the highlights and know the colors and talk with the Lord for just a few minutes. And I still start my day with the Word of the Lord. And then I close it and I get back to my day. There's no excuse for not starting your day with the Lord and ending your day with the Lord. And I'm, I'm not saying, I'm not necessarily saying that, you know. How do I say this? You need to start the day with the Lord. You need to end the day with the Lord. That's just what I'm saying. But there's exhort and rebuke. And you're supposed to do it with authority. Um, maybe it's okay what you're doing. Or maybe it's okay that you're not doing it. And you're just trying to be friendly. You're supposed to speak with authority. Remember what Jesus, the reason that Jesus took out from the scribes and the Pharisees is because he spoke as one with authority and not as the scribes. Maybe, maybe not, I don't know, it could be, it might not be. And, or, like we're reading here, speaking lies and hypocrisies. One minute it's this way, one minute it's not. Oh, do as I say, not as I do. You've heard that one before. Okay? Let no man despise you. But the point I want to make when it says the latter times, it's saying as days go by. We're supposed to be looking for Jesus Christ to come back any day. But as we look at this world, in five years that I've been saved, I've seen so Many people come out that are false converts. They've shown themselves to be false. What it says here, some shall depart from the faith. Okay? A lot of people, they're pointing out that they're false, but there's some that are saved that I know of that they've fallen away. In five years, I've seen them. And it seems to be getting worse and worse as time goes on. So I just wanted to point that out. Okay, latter times, it doesn't say last days. Like it did in 2 Timothy 
3, 1, it says latter times. Timothy, as times get go on and go on, this stuff's going to get worse. And we're being told that in our lifetime, as times go on and on, things are going to get worse and worse and worse. Okay? 1 Timothy 4, 1, okay, where do you leave off? Okay. We do latter times. Then it goes, uh, 1 Timothy, 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1. Whereat the some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. Speaking lies. It's not in the Bible, but they'll say the Bible teaches it. Speaking lies. In hypocrisy, they show themselves out to be hypocrites. They have a, a hidden agenda. And the number one hidden agenda is they want to have sin for a season. They want to justify their sin and looking like the world, living like the world, and going the world's way. And they want to justify it and then claim that they're a Christian, which is hypocrisy. Okay. Uh, having their, their conscience seared with a hot iron. Now, I'm not going to go into it too much here, but remember what I, I did a study on, the word study on conscience, because I wanted to see, people keep saying you can kill your conscience, you can kill your conscience. And I did a study proving you can't kill your conscience. People go to this verse and say, well, it says seared with a hot iron. That means, that means it's killed. When you sear your skin with the hot iron, you damage the nerve endings. Okay? The skin is still alive. You can touch your skin and not feel it, but the skin's still alive. It's not dead, dead. You just damaged it really so bad that you've damaged the nerve endings that you can't feel it. Now, how do I apply this to your conscience? Is seared with a hot iron when it comes to the Bible? Best way I can say is this. There's a couple. My brother had a friend from high school, and he went and slept on the couch was uh, in town. And his friend snored so loud it echoed through the house. And he laid there all night and couldn't hardly sleep. And the next morning, he, his friend and his wife get up, and he asks his friend's wife, and he's like, how can you sleep with him doing that? And she's like, Oh, I did. I just, I've just gotten used to it. I don't even hear it anymore. I can sleep right through it. That's what it means to sear with a hot iron. Their conscience is still there. Their conscience is still saying, "Don't do this. Don't do that. Do this. Do that. You shouldn't be doing that." But they've gotten so used to blocking it out and ignoring it, they don't hear it anymore. That's what it means to have your conscience sear with a hot iron. They just don't hear it anymore. It's still there. The Bible talks about how, and I said, talked about this in the other study, the word study, you can go watch it. But the Bible talks about how your conscience can bear witness with the Holy Ghost. At the great white throne, is your conscience going to be a witness? Yep, I told him not to do that. Yep, I pointed him to you, the true salvation. Yep, this person came by and, and preached the plan of salvation to him, and he wouldn't listen. I was there. If, he, if your conscience is dead, it can't do that. It can't bear witness if it's dead. So that's one of the things I always had to correct because I've heard people say it, that your conscience, you can kill your conscience. The Bible doesn't teach that. What happens is, is you get so used to ignoring your conscience, and as we're reading here, it talks about um, seducing spirits. They listen to other spirits, seducing spirits. The Antichrist spirit. They listen to the, their flesh. They ignore their conscience, and they get to the point where they just don't hear their conscience anymore because they've ignored it so much. All right. So let's start with seducing spirits. Turn to Romans chapter 16, 17. Seducing spirits. Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause division and offenses contrary to the doctrine which we have learned, and avoid them. There we see it again. Avoid them. We read here, doctrines of devils. What does that mean? They're preaching other doctrines contrary to the doctrines that Paul preached. Verse 18, For they that are such serve not our Lord Jesus Christ. That's why I kept saying we're seeing more and more false converts because they're not, they don't serve the Lord Jesus Christ. But their own belly and by good words and fair speeches deceive the hearts of the simple. I want to stop there for a second. The reason I always say get a King James Bible, get it out. People say it's because I'm copying Brother Brian. Well, Brian wasn't the only one that said it. Peter Ruckman, I, th I think, said it too plenty of times. Get your King James Bible. Make sure you're reading it. 
Make sure you're following along. Other brethren have said the same thing. Why do we say that? Because we don't want you to be simple. Because if you're simple, you're easier to deceive. You're so easy to deceive. You're, sli you're easy pickings, as they say. You know, easy target. That's why we say 2 Timothy 2.15, study, study to show thyself approved unto God. Study, study, study. This is the final authority. Make sure you're studying. When you get these Babel buildings, we'll talk about it, when you get these people that basically try to pull you away from the word, and it's about man's words, wisdom of men, the words of wisdoms of men, uh, which we'll be talking about, they're trying to keep you simple. Why? So by good words and fair speeches, they can deceive your heart. They can deceive you. I believe the heart is talking about the soul. They're, they can deceive you. Verse 19. For your obedience has come abroad unto all men. What is he talking about? He's saying, your obedience has come abroad to all men. I've come across men that say, these guys over here, they won't budge. They're not backing down. They're not simple. Okay? They've got doctrine that they were preached to, and they're holding to it, and they're standing their ground. I tried to persuade them. They wouldn't listen. Okay. There's a difference between someone saying, hey, show me in Scripture, and it's not in Scripture, and you need to line up with Scripture, and it's another thing where you're lined up with Scripture, and someone's trying to pull you away from Scripture to the man's opinions and feelings, and you stand firm to Scripture. And you start getting a reputation for like this. Look at this. For your obedience has come abroad unto all men. How is that for a good reputation? Your obedience. You're standing for the doctrines. You're standing firm in the faith. You haven't departed from the faith. Like we're reading there in 1 Timothy 4. I am glad, therefore, on your behalf, but yet I would have you wise unto that which is good and simple concerning evil. Stop there. What's going on? We sometimes, I've had to study things. I've had to study false teachings to find out why they're getting these false teachings, how I can debunk them, okay? Uh, false religions, what they really believe, because, you know, uh, what is it, uh, Mormons, they're not going to be honest with you when they come to your door. They're going to lie to you. They won't tell you everything they believe and what they really believe. Jehovah's Witnesses at your door, they're going to lie to you. They're not going to tell you everything that they actually believe. They'll lie to you. They've been trained and taught to lie where it says, speaking lies and hypocrisy. In verse 2, uh, 1 Timothy 4. They're going to lie to you. So there's times where Paul's like, I need to teach you some things about the enemy. So you can have your guard up and you can be ready. Right? There's nothing wrong with that. It's just you can go too far sometimes in trying to learn things. You know, like, um, what was it, witchcraft and stuff like that. You can go way too far. The Bible says abstain from all appearance of evil. You don't have to go too far in some things to say, hey, it's wicked, it's wrong, and to warn people against it. You don't have to dive too deep. Right? But there's times where, yes, we teach. That's why I always say when I see someone teaching something false, I don't attack the person. I take what they're teaching and I turn it into a Bible study to show what their teaching is wrong and show you what the Bible teaches is right. And that's what we're supposed to do. Verse 20, And the God of peace shall bruise Satan under your feet shortly. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. Right. I look forward to that day. And the God of peace shall bruise Satan under your feet shortly. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. Right. Satan's getting his someday. He knows that he's lost. He's not going to win. Turn to Philippians 3.17. So we see they're using good words and fair speeches, deceiving the hearts of the simple. That's a seducing. It doesn't say seducing or spirit, but these people, the way they talk, they can seduce people. That's why it says good words and fair speeches. Philippians 3.17 Brethren, be followers together of me, and mark them which walk so you have, so as ye have us for an example. Physically an example. Brother and sister in Christ, we're supposed to set the example for each other. People say it's all about words. It's all about words. No, it's words and deeds. We're supposed to set the example. Verse 18. Why are we supposed to set the example? Because we're supposed to be set apart from all these fakes and the frauds. We're, read verse 18. For many walk, of whom I have told you often. Stop right there for a second. 
of whom I have told you often. Brother and sister in Christ, when we in ministry and each other, just as brother and sister in Christ, when we're preaching stuff to people, when you see in the Bible where something is said over and over and over and over, it's very important. All of God's Word is important. But when you see something where it's been said over and over, doctrine, doctrine, stick to the doctrine, stand for the faith, stand, 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 don't faint, don't falter, you know, don't, don't fall into destruction. I call it falling flat on your face, you know. It's important. It's something you need to really heed. So it says, for many walk of whom I have told you often. So what he's going to say again is, it's so important. And now tell you even weeping. Paul's crying. Why? Because we're going to see he's going to be talking about people that fall away. That they don't, they depart from the faith. That they are the enemies of the cross of Christ. These enemies of the cross of Christ, we just read up there in Romans, they come in and deceive the hearts of the simple. These people are false converts, they're fakes, they're frauds, and they come in and they cause the brethren to fall away. Everything Paul preached to them, the love, the time he spent with them, it all gets wasted because they fall, they fall away. It feels like the Lord, he's just crying, oh Lord, I did so much work for you and so much love for these guys, I have so much love for them, present tense. But did a lot of work. For, and look at them. They're falling away. They're being deceived. So they are the enemies of Christ. Whose end is destruction. We read in another verse. In another study. About um, they promised them liberty. But they bring them back into bondage. A liberty is being freed from the law of sin and death. You know. They promise them you can go to heaven when you die. And these people are getting brought into bondage again. They're not going to heaven when they die. They're going to hell. They've been deceived into thinking they're going to heaven. Right? Who, whose end is destruction. That's These guys are going to destruction, and they're trying to destroy Christians. And they're trying to prevent people. Remember I said the two things. They, these false converts are trying to create more false converts, and they're trying to prevent or destroy the life, prevent people from getting saved. They're trying to create as many false converts as possible, and they're trying to destroy the testimony and the lives of Christians that already get saved. They're already saved, so we can't stop them from getting saved, but we can mess them up as much as possible. They're, going, they're heading whose end is destruction. They're heading for destruction, and they're trying to destroy you as much as possible. Whose God, capital G, God, is their belly. It's not Jesus Christ. It's their belly. And they get you. The number one reason that causes people, I'm getting ahead of myself, when it says some shall depart from the faith, sin for a season. Okay? Your flesh. They get you to go after your flesh. That's why anytime he says God is their belly, you know when your belly growls, it's telling you it's time to eat. When your belly feels bloated, it's telling you I'm full, stop eating. It's flesh, it's, it's another way of telling you that your flesh is running you and telling you what to do. All right? That was why it's, it was understandable in that time and it's understandable in this time. That's why it says their God is their belly. They're flesh driven. Okay? And whose glory is in their shame who mind earthly things, whose glory is in their shame. I mean, I can go through a lot of things. Men with long hair. All these professing Christian men that have long hair. Head covering. Long hair is down to the shoulders or longer. You cover your, you comb your hair down on all sides. You can't see your head. I always include the neck. Better air on the side of costume. But a lot of times people would include neck in with the head. Okay? That's why I always cut down to the shoulders. Okay? They are glorying in their shame, and they should be ashamed of themselves. Women, I know it's going to upset some of you. Pants. You go back to the Old Testament, it talks about if men wear women's apparel, or if men, women wear men's apparel, it's an abomination in the sight of God. If you're wearing pants still, you should be ashamed of yourself. Okay? Whose glory is in their shame. You should do everything you can. Men, cut your hair short. It's not hard. Women put on modest dresses. It's not hard. It's not asking the impossible. But if you're minding earthly things, you're going to come up with any and every excuse on why you can have long hair. I'm using those just as an example. There's a lot of example, things in the Bible where, where people should be ashamed of themselves. But I just threw some two visual, right-in-your-face examples. Mm -hmm. If a man wears a dress, they should be ashamed of themselves. Mm -hmm. They mind earthly things. We have these seducing spirits coming in, 
and they're trying to look like Christians, act like Christians, but they're not walking the walk of a Christian. If you're setting the example saying, I'm going to live the life of Christ, we're going to be set apart from them. They're going to start sticking, and they are in these last days, they're starting to stick out more and more like a sore thumb. Okay? We we're pointing them out. That's not a brother in Christ. I thought he was, but after a while, things didn't line up. They had good words and fair speeches, but their life doesn't line up with their words. Okay, and words and deed. Their deeds don't line up with their words. You call them out on their sin, and all of a sudden their word changes. One minute they stand for the faith, the doctrines that are in this book, and when you call them out on their sin, all of a sudden they start changing and start going towards the doctrines of devils. And when they infiltrate brothers and sisters in Christ, that's the reason it says, don't give subjection, no, not for an hour. Okay, um, Avoid them. From such withdraw thyself. Why? Because they come in pretending and saying the right things, words-wise. Oh, I'll say the right things to get into that group. And when they get into that group, they start sowing, seducing spirits, speaking lies and hypocrisy. They'll start saying, well, is that really right? And they'll start sowing seeds of destruction. And when they get called out, and I've seen this happen time and time again, when they get called out, be shown the false and the fakes that they are, they'll try to grab and take as many people away with them. And Paul's crying because he knows it's happening, even in his time, let alone today, how great the falling away is today. Right? People are falling, and I've seen it happen. There's people I used to talk to, pray with, trade verses with, talk to about the Word of God, and I don't anymore. They've fallen away. And they've taken as many people as they can with them. You have all the fakes and frauds that took them with them. They'll try to take as many people as they can with them. Turn to Matthew 18, 15. Chapter 18, verse 15. Remember, seducing spirits, what we're reading here. These are evidence of people seducing people. Mm -hmm. Philippines, we were talking about, you have to set the example so those people will stick out like a sore thumb so they can't seduce people. They can't infiltrate. Matthew 18, 15. Moreover, if thy brother shall trespass against thee, go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. If he shall hear thee, thou hast gained thy brother. But if he will not hear thee, then take with thee one or two more, that in the mouth of two or three witnesses every word may be established. And if he shall neglect to hear them, tell it unto the church. But if he neglect to hear the church, let him be unto thee as a heathen man and a publican. Why did I read that? We read in Philippians how you have people that are just fake and frauds, whose God is their belly. Okay? whose glory is in their shame, their fault, their fake, their frauds, their reprobate. But what about people that are actually saved? Because this is for brethren. When you apply it for instruction and righteousness today, it's for the brethren, not for the lost. Okay? I say this because you're going to have brethren that fall away, and you're going to have to break fellowship with them. And it says, he let him be as a heathen man and a publican. He's to be treated as if he's lost. He or she that falls away, they're to be treated as if they're lost. Why? Because it's supposed to be motivation to get them to repent and get back to the faith that they've fallen away from and back to the fellowship with the brethren. Okay? Whether they've wronged one person physically or spiritually or the brethren as a whole physically or spiritually. Okay? That's, I, I just want to bring that in there because we're going to talk about it. The two types of people that depart from the faith. The easiest way I can say it, the number one reason people depart from the faith is sin for a season. You have false converts because they love their sin. They never gave up their sin as far as their heart. They never took that desire for sin and threw it at the foot of the cross and, have, and their desire changes. Their heart changes the desire to please God and to serve God. They still have that heartfelt desire to serve their flesh and sin. They never gave up that desire. Right? So that's why I say sin for a season. That's the number one reason. You have false converts. They want to still have their sin and be a Christian. You know? And it doesn't work that way. God's going to clean up your life when you get saved. It's guaranteed. Chastening will come. Like I said, recently I fell back into an addiction and God chast chastised me hard. I had a major seizure. Uh, my rooster got eaten by a, could have been a cougar 
or it could have been a raccoon, something as simple as a raccoon, but I had uh, a hen and my rooster taken. Okay. Um, I, I, I'm still, uh, people always say I, I preach that you have to be sinless. Okay, those people are the people, this is talking about verse 2, speaking lies and hypocrisy. Okay, I don't preach that you have to be sinless, brother and sister Christ. I'm still a sinner. I'm a saved sinner. There's times where God chastised me. There's sometimes I get punished by God to get put back on the right track. I fall into temptation and I choose to sin. It's my fault 100%. And I've got to pick up my, I have to deny myself, repent, pick up my cross daily, and get back to serving the Lord. Get that out of my life and get back to serving the Lord. Okay. But there's times where you're going to break fellowship because the person's a false convert. And there's times you're going to break fellowship because the person is departed from the faith, they've fallen away. Those are the two reasons why I wanted to read that verse. Uh, Proverbs 12, 26. The righteous is more excellent than his neighbor, but the way of the wicked seduceth them. You have people come in, oh, it's not that big of a deal. All those video games, they're not that big of a deal. Movies, TV shows, they're not that big of a deal. And they try to seduce you with sin. The flesh gets all riled up. Oh, they said it was okay. They, found, they think they found a loophole that makes it okay where you can sin, 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 sin. Okay. Mark 13, 22. For false Christs and false prophets shall rise and shall show signs and wonders to seduce, even if it were possible, even the elect. I understand that's talking about the time of Jacob's trouble. I understand that. But the point I wanted to point out here was is we got false Christ today. Catholic Church, anytime the priest is up there doing the Eucharist, he becomes another Christ. So we have a lot of false Christ today, but the key word I want to look at is false prophets. Right? I can't remember who did it, but a brother way back when did a study and talked about how, honestly, when you look at the study, we're all prophets. Anybody who gets saved is a prophet. You say, what are you talking about? Well, I, I get saved, and I am saved. I can now tell where I'm going when I die. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that you may know you have eternal life, and that you may believe on the name of the Son of God. You are sealed unto the day of redemption. The purchased possession. Okay? I know I'm going to heaven when I die. That's future prophecy. I'm going to heaven when I die. I can look at people when I preach the plan of salvation and say that if you reject Jesus Christ and you die in your sins, you will go to hell and then get tossed in the lake of fire to burn for all eternity. Time's running out. You need to get saved today. Now's the time of salvation. Today. I can say that. That's a future prophecy. Why? Because we have been given a more sure word of prophecy. I can tell you about the time of Jacob's trouble. Future prophecy prophecy the catching up of the body of Christ future prophecy the thousand year reign where Jesus is going to reign for a thousand years that's future prophecy that's what a prophet is he tells the future we have a more sure word of prophecy and we can preach it you can have a lot of false prophets that will stand there and say I'm going to heaven when I die you want liberty I can promise you liberty but again they're brought into bondage they offer them fake liberty we have a lot of false prophets Brothers and Christ, so many, half the world believes in a Jesus Christ. More than half the world's population believes in a Jesus Christ, not the Jesus Christ. So many people profess to be Christians and tell you, I'm going to heaven when I die. That's future prophecy. That's one way to look at it. And it's a very important way to look at it. you got so many false prophets today going out there. And they're telling you a false plan of salvation saying you can have this world and go to heaven when you die. They give you a false prophet, a prophecy. I've come across so many people who think they're saved, and I sit there and talk to them. They don't believe in a perfect written word of God. They don't believe in the plan of salvation, the changed life gospel. I say that because the gospel that leads to a changed life, guaranteed. They want the gospel that doesn't lead to a changed life so they can have this world and go to heaven when they die. So... The two reasons, two types of people, I put down two reasons on my notes on accident. The number one reason I believe is sin for a season. The number one thing that Satan uses is, yea, hath God said, 
God tells you what sin is, the do's and the don'ts, and your flesh doesn't like it, so he goes, yea, hath God said, so you can have sin for a season, you can continue in your sin, and he says, you can be as God's knowing good and evil. You get to decide what's right and wrong, so you can continue in what? Sin. The thing's been used for the longest time. But you have false converts. Turn to 1 John 4. We're going to read one. Start there. Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. Hereby know ye the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesseth that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is of God. I did a study on this. won't go into it too much here. When you confess something, it comes from the heart. And it's manifested by your actions. Remember what Paul said? The life I'm living. My faith. My sense of purpose. Okay. What I'm going through from the lost world. You know, being uh, attacked. Okay. When you confess something that comes from the heart, it's... The proof, the evidence of that is your actions, the life that you're living. So I've already disbunked that because people say anybody can say that. You're right. Anybody can say Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. But are you living that way? Are you living for Jesus Christ? We keep talking about this. Are you going after Jesus Christ? We're going to read this. Uh, that leads into the whole next part two of this study. Uh, that what keeps a Christian from going after Jesus Christ. Verse 3, And every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not of God. Their actions is how we can tell. That's how all these false converts are coming to light. They can say one thing, but in words and in deeds do all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. You mean the Jesus Christ that is come in the flesh? Absolutely. What's their actions? What's the life they're living? Are they living a life of Christ where they believe in their heart or are they living a life, worldly life, a life of Satan and the world and of the flesh, and just saying it? And this is that spirit of Antichrist, whereof ye have heard that it should come. And even now is already in the, it is a, even now already is it in the world. We just read there in 1 Timothy 4, seducing spirits. Plural. You have Satan and the demons. Okay. But we see there that there's people that are fakes and frauds. I used to use that because it's like uh, there's, a, there's a false spirit and there's a true spirit. And we're supposed to use this book and we are supposed to set the example so when someone sees us as an example and they look at somebody else that's professing to be saved and they're contrary to the body of Christ, us that are standing for the word of God, we're supposed to be able to go, okay, Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits to see whether they are of God. Because there's people that aren't. Okay? So the first type of person you have that, that departs from the faith are the people that were fakes and frauds. They were reprobate. They're lying. They're trying to deceive you. They're hypocrites. I've seen people that they follow three different pastors, or preachers or teachers if you want to say, and all three of those preachers and teachers teach a different plan of salvation. Talk about hypocrisy. There's only one way to heaven, not multiple paths. But they're supporting three different men that teach three different ways to heaven. I've seen that happen before. There's a different spirit there. So that's the false converts. I just want to throw one quick verse. I know there's a lot more we could use for false converts. But I want to throw in there, it says we're supposed to try the spirits to see whether they are of God. You're supposed to test people. Test my spirit. I'm testing yours. Okay? And everyone out there that says, I'm a Christian, we're supposed to test them. They're supposed to prove. It says, test. check whether you be in the faith. Prove your own selves, Paul talks to the Corinthians. You have to prove it. You're supposed to test them. Are they really saved? Okay. Now, what about people that are really saved? What happens to those that depart from the faith. Turn to Colossians 2, 6. As ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in Him. You get saved and you receive the Holy Spirit, Jesus Christ our Lord. You're to walk in Him. There we see it again. All the doctrines that we push you to doctrines, it's about you walking in Him and going after Jesus Christ. Him being the foundation of your life and the head of your life. Authority, he's the ultimate authority, he's your foundation. 
Right? So walk ye in him, rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith. What did we read here? It says, some shall depart from the faith. It's saying here, you're established in the faith. As ye have been taught, 2 Timothy 2.15, you're going to teach, but you also need to study to show yourself approved. As ye have been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving. Remember, in all things, give God thanks. Don't ever forget to give God thanks in everything. And give God glory in everything. Now, what happens? You get a Christian that's doing that. They're in there. What happens? We're, they're given a warning. Something can pull you away from that. Everything we just read there. Verse 8. Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the traditions of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. They're going after the world. They're going after the flesh. But ultimately, what's the opposite of going after Christ? You're going after Satan. You have two choices, brothers and sisters Christ. We made our choice. But the world has two choices. Remember we read how uh, salvation has appeared to all men. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. They have given a choice. You can go after Christ or you can go after Satan. That's your only two choices. There is no in-between. There's people that say, well, I'm an atheist and I don't believe in God. Then you're after Satan. You have these people that we're going to read here, we're going to go through these doctrines that they go against the Jesus Christ of the Bible for a counterfeit Jesus Christ because they're going after Satan. They're not going after Christ. That's your two choices. It's so simple. You have two choices. And the right answer is so simple. But people give in to their flesh. And it becomes about they are lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. And they choose the world and ultimately choose Satan over Jesus Christ. So, um, remember, not after Christ. Doctrines, because we're going to go into part two. Doctrines, we're going to talk about all these different doctrines. A doctrine is meant to aim you at Jesus Christ to get you to go after Jesus Christ. To motivate you to obey Jesus Christ, to live for Jesus Christ. Right? That's what the doctrines are. When I've done this study, I was like, ultimately, when you read that, not after Christ. When you get doctrines of devils, it's to get you to go away from Jesus Christ and go after the world and the flesh and Satan. Right? Not after Christ. So we're going to stop here and we're going to start, we're going to continue in part two.